Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. This is the Fierce Fiduciary Podcast, Episode 10. I'm Brian Beasley, and with me is Dan Albert. Good morning, Dan. Good morning. Standard housekeeping. Anything in this podcast should not be considered investment or financial advice specific to you. For that kind of advice, please consult with a properly registered or licensed advisor. Otherwise, do your homework very, very carefully. So, Dan, what are we talking about today? We're talking about long-term care, Brian. It's a subject that people commonly avoid, and they procrastinate dealing with it. It is what we consider a high impact event on someone's life if it does impact you. Uh, it's disturbing to talk about. Long-term care is, is not a fun subject to get into. And so that may be why folks just generally don't do it. And in addition, people don't have answers as to how to deal with it. And so it's just one of those things that gets left on the table and is never discussed. To and, the and when, you say, when you're saying deal with it, you're talking about just even bringing it up to your Just even ones. having the conversation, yeah. right. Just even having the conversation, talking about it, understanding what this risk is. Because the risk is real to all of us. And it is very impactful and can be devastating. And we'll talk about that as we get into this. But it could be devastating to all of our financial situations. So and, and and also relationships in our families, as we'll talk it talk about later. So yeah, you know it's it's definitely a, a sensitive topic that most people we deal with uh, they do put it off. Um, and, and like you said, they either don't want to, they're just trying to avoid the issue completely. They're just not comfortable, or they just don't know how to even discuss it amongst the family members. But the, the fact of the matter is, aging is a real thing. That's right. And uh, you know. There's, there's just a risk. I mean, unless, unless you, uh, unless you exit this existence on earth quickly, odds are you're going to have some sort of a, an aging situation. That's right. So, so what is, you know, to, to orient people who maybe aren't familiar with this, or maybe this hasn't really impacted their life. They maybe have heard about, you know, nursing homes or whatever, or, or, or maybe, you know, mom or grandma has had some care. Uh, somebody comes into the house and helps them out here and there. But what, what really is this, this idea of long-term care or extended care for, for the elderly? Okay. Well, there are two facets. There's two components or, or two possible uh, impairments that people can have. One is physical and the other is cognitive. And so with the physical aspect of a long-term care need, in industry speak, they're called activities of daily living or ADLs. And that's something that we in the industry will use that term ADLs a lot and activities of daily living. And what that means, those are basic activities that most people can perform without thinking about it, without issues, such as being able to bathe themselves, being able to eat and manipulate the forks and the silverware. Another is dressing yourself in the morning mm -hmm. and changing clothes and putting on your pajamas at night. Another is toileting, going the ability to go to the bathroom by yourself and take care of business there. Right. Uh, there's a thing called continence, and that's just bladder control and bowel control. That if you lose the ability to do that, that means you have a content that might be issue. a triggering ev situation. Correct. When you're talking about these activities of daily living. If the, if you can't do some of these, then that might be a trigger that that's you need triggering this kind a of, long term care. Need. You need some yes. assistance in but, some way. Got it. And the other is transferring. So your ability to get from your bed to the kitchen table, or from your bed to a chair, or into a wheelchair. Getting up out of a sofa. Yes, correct. That's a really common one. So these six activities of daily living, bathing, eating, dressing, toileting, continence, and transferring, if you start losing the ability to do any of these, that's that physical aspect of having a long-term care need. The other is cognitive, and that's where you start having mess, uh, memory issues. And you might have shorter long-term memory issues. Uh, 
lose your orientation to person, place, and time. So you kind of forget what what day it is regularly. Or mm-hmm. you're up in the middle of the night and you think it's daytime. Um, you're on your way to an errand that you did 15, 20 years ago. That's to a right. place that doesn't exist anymore. That kind of thing. That's right. Uh, I, I've known other folks who, grandparents who were living their life as if it was back in the 1920s and 30s. And so they were going about their daily life as if they were a 20-something-year-old, mm-hmm. even though they're in their 80s with Alzheimer's or dementia. And so those types of aspects, uh, those get into your cognitive impairments. Uh, your judgment as it relates to safety, uh, your ability to be on your own safely. So I had a... My wife's grandmother had a townhome for a while, and one of the red flags that came up is when we came in to check on her, and the gas burner on her stove was on full blast. Full flame. Full flame going, and she had papers and newspapers off to the side, just off to the side of the stove. And so it was. And there's uh, nothing cooking on the stove. No, it's just no. Open it, flame. It was just open flame. Wow. She must have triggered it, and then uh, she was sitting in the living room when they came in, and this thing was burning. It was in the middle of the summer, so uh, you might think that maybe she's trying to warm the house for mm-hmm. warmth, but mm-hmm. no, it wasn't anything like that. It was that she turned the thing on, wasn't aware of it. The fact that papers were right there. Right. So it was a, a disaster waiting to happen. So that's... Yeah, triggering event. I mean, along those lines, I mean, we had a family member. Um, this is back in the 80s when I was a kid, but uh, it was I think it was my, my mom's aunt. Um, it was kind of the triggering thing, that the wake-up call to the family was, hey, hey, there's a problem, was that um, her son showed up and uh, at her home to check on her, and she was in the garage with the engine running and the garage door closed. Yeah, oh, jeez. And he said, hey, what's going on? She goes, oh, well, I'm going to go pick up your dad at the, you know, at work, I'm going to go pick him up at the, he worked in the oil fields in Kansas. And he said, and, and now this is Dallas, 1980s, this, and her, her husband's long deceased. And, and, uh, her, her son realized that, uh, you know, she's going on an errand from a long time ago mm-hmm. and she forgot to open the garage door. So if she didn't open the garage door, she was going to suffocate from carbon monoxide. And if she, had actually put the car in gear and left, she would have driven right through the garage door. And so that goes to your whole safety thing. I mean, this is, this stuff gets real when the brain starts malfunctioning. That's right. That's right. Uh, and there's a component to this whole thing that, Hey, medical science is improving and we are living longer and we're not dying from things that have historically killed us. Heart attacks, strokes, People tend to live after that. And just when, long enough for the brain to start maybe malfunctioning or that's right. And so now you're you're living as a stroke victim with these impairments. And so right. long term care unfortunately be, is becoming more and more of an issue. So those are the triggering elements. It can be physical, it could be cognitive. Mm-hmm. So what are some of the types of care? There are things called custodial care and skilled care. When you look at uh, custodial care, what custodial care is that ability to uh, help somebody get out of bed, the daily companionship, taking care of their personal hygiene, that kind of stuff is custodial care. Skilled care is what you get in a hospital. That's when you go to the doctor, they run tests on you, Uh, They may need to change IV bags, uh, but they're doing skilled labor where... You'd also get skilled labor at like a nursing home, potentially. Uh, Correct, yes. Okay, got it, got it. And so with the long-term care, that's primarily custodial care. So 90% of the care that's actually provided for these types of events is custodial care. A lot of it's like that assistance. That's right. And that's where families get involved and they're helping take care of mom or grandma and they're helping them out of bed, picking clothes and just checking up on them. Or maybe even grandparents are moving in with the younger generation. So 
you have these various types. And this guides a little bit. I, we don't want to get into too much detail here, but there are various places where this type of care is delivered. Primarily, people want to deliver their, this long-term care in their homes. They want to stay at oh, home. Oh, yeah. I'd imagine most people want to possible. stay. Yeah. Right. And so uh, that's your first primary source. It's with aging, as people live longer, it gets more and more difficult for people to stay in the homes. Sometimes relatives are not geographically uh, located close to mom and dad or grandma and grandpa. Right. And so there's a real issue that even if you have someone, a husband, wife, grandma, grandpa, they're living at home and we look at that from afar and say, well, that's great. They're able to stay at home. The real problem with that is that we are social creatures. And the truth of the matter is these folks who are having this need, their social lives may have evaporated as they become prisoners in their own homes. And to some extent, I've seen that happen in my own family from time to time too, where somebody's, they live alone, they're at a distance and the family doesn't realize what the day-to-day life is like for them. That's right. Yeah. So there are facilities that are out there to help people. There's assisted living. Uh, there's assisted living facilities. You have adult daycare, uh, hospitals and nursing homes. Got All it. of these various facilities provide some level of care. And there's like an escalation of care from, That's correct. from somebody yeah. that comes in and checks on you and cooks you food to all the way to skilled nursing care. So there's this huge, like almost like a dimmer switch where you can turn up the, the light, yeah. if you will. Brian, we have this book called The Conversation, Helping Someone You Love Plan for an Extended Care Event. It's written by Harley Gordon. So we're going to use this book to help us in this conversation for this episode to talk about this long-term care need. As Harley Gordon calls it, it's extended care. So when you hear extended care, think long-term care. So this book is a good resource for having a conversation with folks. And so I just want to talk a little bit about... So this is this book, the, the purpose of this book is really to help people push through that, that wall that they have where they're uncomfortable talking to their family members or or their spouse about this sensitive, difficult issue. Yes. And, and, and if we can help people at least start that process, yes. then, maybe, then maybe it can help move things forward a little bit without causing a lot of stress and pain with the family. That's right. So my goal and my hope for the podcast for us having this conversation is to help people be able to take that first step and have a conversation. So let me talk a little bit about Harley Gordon. Here, here's a little bit about him. Harley Gordon is a founding member of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, the nation's largest group of attorneys focused on the unique issues of aging Americans. He has over 35 years of experience working with these families, particularly those who have not planned for an extended care event and are now overwhelmed by its emotional, physical, and financial consequences. Mr. Gordon was voted one of the 10 most influential professionals in the field of extended care planning by Senior Market Advisor magazine. His views have been featured in the Wall Street Journal, CBS Evening News, PBS Frontline Documentary, Who Pays for Mom and Dad?, and numerous financial service publications. So this guy's been around, he's got a ton of experience, and he's even had these type of experiences within his own family. So as he's writing, you get a sense for his own personal situation that he's putting into this book and he's injecting himself into this book. That's really valuable too, because you know it's it just means so much more when you've gone through something personally. Yeah, yeah. it's not academic to him. Right. And you get a sense of that. And so in this book, The Conversation, uh, that's where he's able to give us a new way or a, a groundbreaking way of 
of having that conversation with people and trying to get with, through that with your initial, family mem- right with your family members and so let me start with the forward of the book it's the it starts out as i researched the state of caregiving in this country for the documentary and thou shalt honor i realized just how difficult that burden is to children who have taken on the substantial responsibilities of adulthood. Although many step up to the challenge of providing what amounts to constant care for a frail parent, the consequences to themselves emotionally, physically, and financially, and their families are, as Harley aptly puts it, serious if not irreversible. Since providing care to a parent or loved one often falls to a child, it is essential that they be given the tools to talk to their parents about the impact of doing so. The conversation provides these tools in a wholly unique way that gives parents the motivation to take action to protect their children. So this foreword is written by Dale Bell, and he's the producer of a PBS documentary called And Thou Shalt Honor. It's a two-hour episode that premiered in 2002, and that's available uh, to folks on the PBS website. It's an, excellent, it's an excellent look into what this extended care is all about. Got it. This book, he's talking about a new way of having a conversation. What's the normal way people do it? Like, how are people getting it? Yeah. What, what's making it hard for people? Okay. Well, when you start... Traditionally, when people are, you have kids or a parent taking a look at their other spouse and they're trying to decide how to bring this up, they're doing their research, they're doing Google searches, they're putting together facts and figures, and uh, they come and they approach dad, for example, and say, hey, dad, did you know that there's a 43% chance that every 65-year-old is going to have some sort of long-term care need? in their lifetime and they start spouting facts and say we got to talk about this because these facts are real and meaningful and you generally run into a brick wall when that happens uh folks parents they they could either uh just kind of ignore and say you know what i I don't want to talk about that right and let's you know let's not have that conversation uh, because it's not going to happen to me. Uh, the other thing is, you know, they say, well, you know, it's, if something happens to me, uh, I'm just going to, my wife's going to get the silver shovel and knock me on the back of my head and, the, and there won't yeah, be they're, an they're, issue. They're kidding and they're making light of it. Because That's right. It's just, it's another way of just avoiding the conversation completely. That's right. Like, whatever, I've heard other you know. people say, you know what? I don't even want to talk about that. And who can blame them? Because like we've talked about in the beginning, this kind of conversation, you're talking about, you know, death is approaching and you're losing the ability to take care of yourself. So this traditional approach has traditionally ended in these brick walls where people can't break through those. And you have many, many families who just never have, are able to break through to have the conversation yeah. about what do we do with them. And, and, and the sad thing about that is that when there's a brick wall like that, you game that out. You got to game that out over time. How's that going to end? That's right. You know, you, mom and dad never was, were willing to even have the con, you know, have a, a discussion about this this topic, and therefore, what happens? A choice gets made. A choice to do nothing, <laughs> and then every everything becomes chaos and a fire drill later on. So I'm sure we'll get into that. So this book contains some groundbreaking ways to have a different conversation. And so I want to read an excerpt. It's, it's a little lengthy, but I, I want to get through this expert to give an idea of the different way of viewing things. And when you listen to it, think about, the, in the traditional way, you're thinking about uh, facts and figures and the chances of something happening to you, the parent. So I'm the person that might get sick. Right. And, and so everybody's talking to me about me, you know, the grandpa who, you know, hey, dad, hey, grandpa, you might have this issue. Shouldn't we think about some sort of a plan here? Yeah, Gramps, 40% chance of you're going to have an event. Well, it's not going to happen to me, says grandpa. 
Got so it. you've got, got that's the traditional way. The new conversation, this different conversation, is where you're not focusing on the risk of having the event, but it's rather looking at the consequences of if the event takes place. And so the focus comes not on you, Grandpa, but on what happens to Grandpa's family, what happens to Grandma, what happens to the kids. And so kind of get listen for that as I go through this. Okay. So it's, it's a couple pages here, but bear with me, Brian. All right. Husband and wife talking. Wife is talking to husband. Tom, I think we are at the point in our life where we need to have a discussion about what would happen to me and the children if you needed care over an extended period of years. Dad, I really don't want to discuss that right now. Wife, I'm not thrilled with the subject, but we have to. Why? Because it involves not just my well-being, but the kids. What do you mean the kids? Okay, says the wife. It starts with having an understanding of what extended care is. It's necessary because of illnesses that cannot be cured, like dementia and Parkinson's. As they progress, they so severely compromise you that the people you said you would take care of, us, would have no choice but to take care of you. And that's the problem. I'm worried that it would have such a negative impact on me that one of our kids would have to get involved. I can't imagine that's what you would want. Dad says, of course not. They have their own lives. The problem, says Mom, is they don't have a choice. They won't have a choice. And it won't all, and it won't be all the children, but likely Maria, one of their daughters, for example. We have to think about how disruptive it would be to her husband and children. We also have to think about what would happen to her relationship with her brothers. I really don't want to think about it, says Dad. To tell you the truth, the whole thing is depressing. And by the way, this whole thing is based on my needing care, which I don't think I will. So there you go. Uh, getting back to that brick wall. Absolutely. So here's Mom. Tom, I'm not suggesting that you will need care. This is not a discussion about the risk of it happening, but the consequences to us if it did. Are you trying to scare me? Stop for a second. Let's take a look at this as a different way. Let, let me start again here. Let's take a look at this a different way. I believe you. I believe that you don't think you will ever need care. So let's get that risk of having that happen out of the way. Zero risk. I'm not suggesting, and I'm suggesting that we focus on the awful consequences to the children. If I become ill taking care of you, or I can't because I died or became seriously ill myself. What choice would they have? So I am suggesting that you look at this as a set of consequences, which would be 100% to their lives and relationships with their siblings. I can see the possibility that they may never speak to each other again over this. Husband, I never thought about it that way. But look, we have enough assets to pay for care. I think so too, says mom. But I'm, I've been thinking about what would pay for the care. It would come from income, but we're pretty much committed to expenses. If we used it, we may not be able to keep those commitments. We have enough assets though, says dad. We do, but let's play it out. The assets are used to generate income. I'm really nervous that if we use them and they don't generate income, if, if we use them, they won't generate income. If the illness lasts long enough, they may be very little left. Dad, this whole thing makes me uncomfortable, but I never thought about it from the kid's point of view. What do you think we should do? Mom, I think it starts with both of us agreeing that we have to do something. We need a plan. I have to make sure that if either of us needs care, we can stay home. I want to make sure that taking care of me will not devastate you emotionally and physically and the other way around. But more importantly, I want to make sure that our kids are not involved. 
Dad, I don't have an issue with anything you say. Are you su suggesting that we look into insurance? Mom, that's part of it. We need to talk to someone who can explain the different types of products. Will you do that for me? Dad, sure. Let's f find someone we can talk to. So there you go, Brian. Thanks for... Yeah, and there, I mean, as, you, as, you're, as you, you're reading his, you know, this, this hypothetical conversation with, between a husband and wife, the things that s stick out is that there's this persistence that she had to just patiently get through the no, no, no. Look at it from a different angle. Look at it from a different angle. And, you know, I, now the, somewhere there you, you said, let's not talk about, let's assume that there's no issue with the risk to him, to Tom. Right. And, and the way it was pivoted, I, I didn't quite, I didn't quite understand that. So like, so there's zero risk. He's going to have care, but she's saying, but what if she gets sick? There's a risk. One of them is going to have, going to need care. Is that the angle she took? Uh, she was, let me go back into that part. Okay. Here we go. I believe you. I believe that you don't think you'll ever need care. So let's get that risk of happening out of the way. Right. So you have a zero risk of it happening. This is to Tom. This is to Tom. Got Mom it. talking to Tom. Mom then says, I am suggesting that we focus on the awful consequences to the children if I become ill taking care of you. And she's saying those consequences are so she's 100% saying that, that if something happens, the yeah. So this is basically is this. So this is like this is like a, a a low probability event, but a really potentially high impact event, devastating impact. And and honestly, these are the kind of things we take we we take care of these things all the time in regular life. People have insurance on their homes because what if that fire happens? What if a tornado comes through and wipes it out. People in coastal areas often will get flood insurance because it happens, hurricanes or whatever. And, you know, at eat, we still cover these, I, these risks. Yeah. They're out there because, and it's not because they're high probability. This isn't a question about probability. It sounds like this conversation is more about the impact. It's the impact. It's the consequences. I, I'm not going to get into a, a, a car accident. It's not going to happen to me. My house isn't going to burn down. It's not going to happen to me. I'm not going to die. I'm but not going to get does, disabled. So none of these things are going to happen to me. But if they do, it's a huge impact. Potential. That's right. That's right. So Harley, in his book, he provides the information in here, and he builds that foundation to help someone have this type of a conversation to change the dynamic of the discussion and this book contains a wealth of information and it's a good reference guide for folks to help just better educate them right. on this whole long-term care situation and issue and and so the focus you know, initially the focus is on the toll that it could take on the family can you does he does he dig more into that is there something yeah so let's let's that? focus on that because as we've talked about early, we've alluded that it really takes a toll. So let me kind of flip through to that section. It takes a toll emotionally and physically on family. So looking at it physically. You're talking about the caregiver themselves. The care, yes, you Got look it. at the caregiver themselves. So we'll, p we'll pick on Tom, poor Tom. So he's the one who has the long-term care need. The wife is going to need to take care of him if they stay in the house like they want to do. That's usually the default. It's like I'm gonna we're gonna do what we can without needing somebody else to come into the house. Yes, that's correct. Got it. And so you have uh, the wife who is now muscling uh, a full grown male around the house. If if he's no longer able to get up out of bed, you may have a slight woman having to manhandle a 180 pound person who can't move around and changing clothes and moving from chair to chair to wheelchair to couch to bed and also someone untrained in those kinds of techniques because there are there's like a whole area of 
specialty yeah. to help someone and assist someone safely and safely for both parties. And if you don't know those techniques, you could really get hurt. That's right. And so over time, the caring, the caregiver can, their body can get worn down. Their stress levels can go way up as they are losing normal sleep and their sleep patterns change or disintegrate as they're taking care of their loved one. And right. so it's just this spiraling yeah. effect where the ultimate result is the caregiver gets sick, sometimes chronically. So that's one aspect of how this can take a toll on the family. Bottom line is that is not sustainable. Right, right. Heck, you know, even even for, for me or you, I mean, that's that would be exhausting for us. Yes, absolutely. So uh, the other aspect of it is relationships change or have the potential to change. So as husband is being cared for by wife more and more, she may be viewed, their relationship as husband and wife may become very distorted or completely disintegrate and it becomes one of caregiver so that husband no longer views his wife as his wife and vice versa. So the husband's no, he's now the patient and that nature of that relationship can change forever. You have a child coming in to help take care of dad. And if the child has to help dad take a shower and do some of these other things, that can impact the way each of them views the other. And so there's that potential for relationship change. Uh, the other is from an emotional aspect, especially if you have more than one child. If you have a family of multiple kids and you know, mom and dad say, we're taking care of ourselves, right? We're doing it ourselves. You guys live your lives. But if you've got a loving family and you have children watching from afar and they're watching mom and her life disintegrate as she's trying to take care of dad and she's just not able to do it. Well, if, if you're in a loving situation, these kids, they're not just going to sit by and watch it happen in many instances. I, they're going to step in. They don't want to see the situation continue. Uh, and so the family's going to get involved. And when that happens, if, when you have more than one kid, you may find in most situations where one child will step up and take on the primary role of taking care of the parents. And uh, that might just be because of geography could play a part. Your, your brother lives across the country, right? Right, right. So right. If, if your parents are in town, you may, by default, be forced to become that primary caregiver. It, yeah, absolutely. So uh, you have that situation, and, and now you inject into it that, okay, now you being uh, the person locally, you're the boots on the ground, so to speak. So you're going in, you're taking care of them, uh, you're going there every day perhaps, or maybe it starts out, you're there every week, and then it becomes every day, and sometimes you're there multiple times a day. And people at a distance, and it's happening more and more in this country where people do scatter, spread out, because we're a mobile society. That's right. You could have siblings that are hundreds of miles away, then you have the other sibling that's right nearby, and just like they no, no one at a distance is able to keep tabs on really what's going on with mom and dad and day to day and, and notice that deterioration that whether it's physically or cognitively also when that, that responsibility steps up and really ramps up for that, for that conveniently located local sibling that's taken care of mom and dad, where, like you said, they're, they're there once a week. Then all of a sudden it's every couple of days. Then it's every day they're there and they're getting calls in the middle of the night because something's you know crazy. The people at the distance, they just don't keep tabs. They're, it's it's impossible. They're yeah, not everybody know. has their own lives. Yeah. Yeah, and so the one sibling who's there, they start sacrificing their life, or they put their life on hold, I guess is a better way to say right. it. They put their life on hold to take care of mom and dad's situation. And so now you have this 
relationship that's starting this dynamic. And now you might have uh, decisions, medical decisions that come into play where or, or having additional care providers coming to the home. And it's the one sibling who's local and present all the time who sees what si the situation is. They have the best understanding of what should be done. And so they start making calls on, hey, we got to get mom a 24-hour person to be there to help move dad around. And now you have siblings from out of town, you know, injecting their opinions and, and they care and they love, they love the parents. And the truth is that everybody wants to be involved and wants to be as helpful as they can. They can mean well and do their absolute very best. And the truth is that if there's no plan in place that mom and dad helped engineer and communicate with the kids, this is what we want. This is how we want this to be handled. Left unsettled then you have a situation where you have multiple siblings trying to take a vote and discuss and make these decisions. That's right. That's right. And, and then you end up with discord and frustration. And even though people mean well, and they love each other and they truly do, the stress of that situation is damaging to those relationships. It can and sometimes absolutely permanent. fracture those relationships. Right. So now uh, step, move forward a little bit. And now, one of the parents has passed on and the surviving parent needs care. And now medical decisions need to be made. And maybe it's a question of medicines or the type of care that's being delivered. And who's making that call? If there's no plan in place, how are these people, how are these kids interacting with each other? And how are they making these decisions one, they don't know what mom and dad's intentions were because there was no plan. There were no documents in place. You know, it, it, you know, you're down to one parent. You could have a situation where, you know, the surviving parent that needs the care is no longer competent to make those con those decisions. Yeah. But if it wasn't settled in advance, now you got to go to court and declare mom or dad incompetent, and that's a costly and expensive process and stressful and crazy. It's it's nuts. And if you have those those you know, like, like you said, those people at distance, they may not really be able to keep tabs on what's going on with mom. They interact with mom or dad, um, you know, remotely by phone. It sounds like they're okay. How's sure. it going? Oh, I mean, people will always say, Hey, how's it going? I'm fine. Everything's good. I don't want you to worry about me. And that's, that's the message that mom or dad will send. The truth is, is that not only are they not able to keep tabs on what's going on with the person who needs the care, they have no idea what the day-to-day -day strain is on that primary caregiver member of the family that may be local and convenient. Right. So you have that aspect. You have the aspect that the kids don't want to make those kind of decisions about what does mom and dad, what did they want? You, the kids don't want to be put in that position. I mean, how just devastating. think about how much easier it is on the family yeah. when mom and dad have said, all right, guys, here's the deal real quick. You know, we've, we've come up with these documents. Yeah. If this happens here, you're going to be in charge and it's your job to make this decision over here. This is your job to make this other decision. And then the third sibling here, you're the backup, that kind of thing. Because, and here's why we discussed this and here's where we've had that conversation and you all agreed to take those roles and there are, everybody's involved in the, in the planning process of how this is going to play out. And you make those decisions in advance. It makes them infinitely easier to manage in the future. You know, uh, I heard this uh, taught, Years ago, uh, I was at some leadership conference, and and the gentleman on stage, he said, the decisions you make well in advance are way, way easier to manage. So, for example, if you decided, I'm not ever going to smoke, and you were younger when you made that decision, then when the opportunity presents itself, you've already made the decision years ago. Mm. It's easy. No, I'm not going to smoke, or I'm not going to take drugs, whatever it is. The decisions, or I'm going to stay fit. I'm going to eat well and exercise. If that's a decision made early in life, it just becomes a part of who you are. If you try to make that decision at age 55 after a heart attack, that's virtually, you know, it's just much more difficult. 
Well, it's no different with this decision. All these things related to care or legal authority, healthcare uh, authority, if you involve the family together in the process and everybody's on board with the planning, you can have these conversations when everybody's just of good, sound mind and body, and it's handled in advance. And then there's no question. Yeah. It's it's the uncertainty thing. It's the arguing back and forth over, well, we should do this versus this versus this. That's hard enough when everybody's in the room together. Mm-hmm. And it's not necessarily going to be easy. But it's infinitely easier than dealing with it when mom or dad are having cognitive issues and we're worried about their physical safety in their own home and you have all these conflicting perspectives. Yes. And they're fighting you on the decision that right. so you even include that from the cognitive aspect. Or somebody wants a vote because they care, yeah. but they don't have the ability to really be involved and step up and take the responsibility mm-hmm. of those decisions. It really becomes a, a strain on yeah. some people and they're definitely on the relationships. So to think about it, I'm just thinking of a, a visualizations coming to me right now. It's kind of like planning a journey down the road. If you have a conversation with the family, you know what road you're trying to travel down. You know what your destination is, what mom and dad want. You want to go down this road here. And the more conversations you know, having a plan set up, that's putting guardrails on both sides of that road to help the family make decisions to keep mom and dad on the path that they've determined. And so it's not a situation where, okay, here we are. We don't even know where mom and dad are trying to go. And so here we are, the kids, siblings, fighting amongst ourselves, trying to figure out. We all love them, but my my decision or what I think mom and dad wants could be completely different than what my brother thinks mom and dad wants. And so here I am with my brother sitting down, you know, trying to make a decision and it's it's stress, and that gets back to where families can be uh, really impacted. I mean, how often is this thing? Yeah, let me talk. Up? Let me talk about a few stats that we pulled up. Uh, one stat here: one in four Americans are caregivers. So twenty at, at some point in their life, or yes. at any moment. Like, well, right now, 25% of Americans are caregivers. So 25% of us are already providing care to somebody. To somebody. Yes. Wow. Pew Research Center did a, a study in 2013 that one in eight Americans ages 40 to 70 is both raising a child and taking care of a parent. So one in eight, that's 12.5% of us, we're taking care of kids and a parent, and that's and that's at some level. That doesn't mean that, like, yeah. you're literally doing full time care for your parent necessarily, but you've got a parent that needs some checking up on. Yes, yeah, you're, so it's you're very providing. Novels. You're a caregiver in some capacity. Got it. So that's we've heard, been hearing about this term in the news, and the last several years, it's called the sandwich generation. Yes, where people are getting squeezed on both ends. Is that like a, a Gen X kind of phenomenon? A little bit where you've got kids that are in high school and getting ready to go off to college. You've got parents trying to figure out how to take care of the kids going to college. Right, right. And at the same time, the grandparents are losing their abilities to make decisions. And now some folks are have to now think about putting on additions to their homes and modifying their homes to be able to bring grandparents into their home where before they were uh, living, you know, by themselves and, and you're getting this pressure and the squeezing. Yeah. And that's not something you want to have happen in, in a fire drill type situation where something's happened and now you have to do something. Yeah. Uh, like we said earlier, it's, it's much better if you can plan ahead, you know, odds are, odds are in terms of probability might not be you. Yes. And here's a, a story from my own past that shows how far reaching this whole thing can be, that this, it can be multi-generational. 
Can I go change re- rewind a little? I, yeah, I just, absolutely. I just, I just focused on you. Know, uh, I just said odds are it might not be you, in all probability, but like we said before, the impact is so gigantic; it's worth your attention. Absolutely, it's very important. I just want to make sure I key in on that. I don't want somebody to think, "Hey, we, you know, we said, hey, odds are it's not you." <laughs> right, right. Wait, yeah, it sounds like Tom. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to happen to me. I don't want to talk about it. It's again, huge, huge, huge potential impact. You need to pay attention to this issue. Yeah. So you were, you were tell your story. Yeah. If you don't mind, uh, my wife's grandmother was in an assisted living home for 13 years. And during that time, uh, my wife and my kids, I have two daughters and both of them participated in the caregiving and visiting with great grandma. Mm -hmm. And so my daughters at the time, there was one event in particular that I recall where my younger daughter was three years old and my older daughter was seven and they had gone to the nursing home. And uh, my kids like to wear dresses, especially my younger daughter. She would wear dresses all the time and she would have these red Ruby kind of shoes that sparkled a little bit like Dorothy from the Wizard of Oz. Got it. So here she is in probably a red top, orange dress, green stockings, and these red shoes. So Sounds like she totally matched. Absolutely. She loved getting <laughs> dressed. And uh, she would have her purse. And so she would go to the assisted living facility uh, that was where, where great grandma was at. And the other residents would, you know, ask her to twirl and they would talk, ask her to show them the contents of her purse. And so my kids really got involved with this generation of folks, these people who were living there. And uh, my older daughter at the time was playing the piano, and there was a piano in the corner, and from time to time she would play some songs for the residents. And there was one time in particular where uh, Grandma was upstairs in a room, and uh, there was my younger daughter, three years old, and she's trying to help out. And in a, with a very serious voice says, okay, grandma, you need to take your medicine because she was, grandma was arguing with my wife about taking the medicine. She didn't want to do it. And here's this three-year-old daughter, three-year-old girl, grand, great-granddaughter stepping up to the plate and saying, hey, grandma, you got to take your medicines. And so uh, it's just... I mean, everybody's involved. Everybody's involved. And uh, no man is an island. No person's an island. And this thing, it, it could just be multi-generational. This was her great-grandmother that she was involved with. And I, mean, I, I, don't even, I can't imagine being a three-year-old and even having that thought. And it's, it's been impactful. For, I, I do believe it, it's been meaningful for her. And she thinks on it from time to time. And it's... It helped develop. It's part of who she is now, and that's how she developed. So it takes a toll on the family, I guess. Right. So and there's no avoiding. There's no avoiding it. I mean, that's that's the main thing. That's the most important thing for sure is mm-hmm. the family relationships and and making sure that your loved ones are 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 good. And everybody everybody's hope, I think, would be that. When you're sick, when you're ill, that you you don't become a detriment to your own family that you've tried to raise in a lo- you know loving way, and you you want your children to get along after you're gone, and that's the most important thing for sure. That's and I'm glad I'm glad he focused on that first. That said, there's no getting around it. If you need this kind of care, it's not free. That's right. In most cases. So we got to have that discussion about what, how this gets paid for and what types of services pay for what types of care and that kind of thing. So can we dive into that just a little bit? Sure. Absolutely. That, that's a good thing to get into. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me drink a little water here. So the way everybody, most of us think about care is pay for it yourself. I'll just self-fund it. And so that is absolutely one way to pay for 
these long-term care, extended care needs. But when you look at it, uh, you may have a very strong portfolio. You may have a million dollar portfolio. And you say, hey, we've got enough money. We can cover it. The reality is assets in themselves don't pay for the need. Income pays for the need. And you need to have you need, need to have that income. I mean, you have you have a trade off there. So, I mean, you you could you could eat the goose or you can use the golden eggs. Yes. And so that's first... not that's not that's not simple math. That's, no, it's that, not. that it takes it it unfortunately it does take a comprehensive look at the entire financial situation of that that couple to see okay play it out if this then that mm-hmm. what. If you know, and in some cases the math does work out for sure, but it's you don't want to assume that because if you're living off of a pile of, of of investments, and then you take half that pile away, guess what? Whatever income was being generated just got cut in half. That's the issue. That's right. That's right. What What are some? What about like, it's, if people aren't doing it themselves, a lot of people will think, "Hey, uh, doesn't Medicare cover this?" Right. So Medicare is the, that's the big one. Folks say Medicare will take care of it. And that's, that's not true at all. That's a misconception. Yes. Uh, Medicare covers that skilled care portion. It's, it's hospitals and doctors. That's correct. It's It's doctor visits. It's it's not long-term extended custodial and nursing care. That's correct. And it, it gets into rehabilitation care. And Medicare only goes out a hundred days. So I've been in the hospital. I had uh, a broken leg. You know, and this happened in our family. We had you know somebody slipped and broke. You know, slipped, broke a leg, and it was a it was the femur. It was the upper leg bone. I mean, Ouch! I mean, the whole rod put in there and everything. It was really it was a big deal. They had to go into a rehab facility, and the rehab facility was basically a nursing home Mm -hmm. and it was like six weeks or whatever. And so Medicare would cover that kind of rehab up to what, like you say, a hundred days. Yes. But after a hundred days, that's it. You got to go back home. And that's not that's appropriate for rehabbing a broken leg. It's not appropriate for Alzheimer's disease or dementia. Right. Right. Or Parkinson's disease where you no longer have the ability to, do one of those correct activities of daily living, correct. like transfer. Um, you can't ignore veterans, right? The but veterans the, have benefits at the at the Veterans Administration, the VA. Correct, but to, with the Medicare, it's such a big thing. I I found a resource that oh okay, folks can get more information from the government at longtermcare.gov. The website longtermcare.gov. They have really good information that's easy to read about medicare specifically so does it go beyond medicare that it does it's a much wider uh range it's a good website for excellent resources but specifically for this issue because we find that so many people think that i've encountered so many people think that medicare is the solution and medicare is going to take care of it and so Hey, the box is checked. Medicare has got me covered. No, it's not. And that's not not true. Not true. So there's the Veterans Administration. That's another government organization. In general, uh, that is not an organization that's going to be helpful as well. One interesting fact that Harley Gordon points out in his book is that there is a portion, there is one program in the Veterans Administration that is highly rated and highly touted as a good model. But for it, long-term care. Yes, for long-term okay. care that other people could emulate. The reality of that is it only covers about 12,000 veterans out of 9 million. So that's less than that's 0.13%. That's less than 0.2%. That's 20% of 1%. How, how do you say that? It's a very it's small, a small number. It's a small number. It's Odds like, are you're not going to get that program. So 
it, it's the Veterans Administration is great. And they do what they do and they take care of our service members, but they're primarily focused on folks who are injured and disabled in the line of they're in the service of their country. And then you have Medicaid, yes. which is, the, and this, the distinction between Medicare and Medicaid is often confused. Medicare is the regular health insurance for retired people, basically. And it's federally funded, federally administered. Medicaid is federally funded, but it's administered state by state. And it's really designed to be the backstop for the destitute, for the poor. Yes. And so uh, from a technical way of saying that is it's means tested. And what that means is in order to qualify, they look at your assets and your income. And that's what right. determines if you're able to qualify for Medicaid. So in short, Medicaid requires you to become impoverished before it it pays for your benefits. So if you're a person of some means and uh, you have a pretty good income in retirement and you say, hey, Medicaid is going to take care of me. Yes, they will. And that is a program that will. Number one, there it's going to require that you spend down all of your assets. Number two, you may have to forfeit a portion of your income. And number three, Medicaid is... Uh, they will determine where you stay, that you will stay in a place wherever there is a bed available. So, yeah, you may not have that that luxury of choice of going to the place you really want to be. It might not. It might be. Uh, it might could be a nice place, but it, it could be um, a place where you would not have chosen. It could be a place that's inconvenient for people to come visit you. Who love you, yes, and that 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 that's just a bad bad situation all around. So, like most things in our life that are low probability, but potentially very high impact, oftentimes the solution is insurance of some kind, and it's no different with long term care. There's 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 insurance, and it's not as simple as people think it probably is in terms of that a lot of people think, oh, there's one th one thing. It's certainly not as simple as people want it to be. There's, there's sure. lots of options of how to deal with and ensuring this risk or mitigating this risk financially. Yes. Um, so obviously some of the, the traditional. Yeah. Yes. Let's talk about a few yeah, of let's these. Let's talk about those. Uh, under um, insurances. The first and the original is this traditional long-term care insurance. And that is similar to disability insurance or homeowner's insurance. It's you pay premiums each and every year, and you have benefits that are paid out monthly based on the underwriting process that you go through and based on what you pay for. So you're paying a premium. You're paying a premium. If you have a need, they pay out. Yes. If you don't have a need, you're out whatever the premium was. That's correct. It's use, yes. it or, it's use it or lose it type situation. Yes. What else do we have? Well, and the insurance company has been very good about, about um, expanding their, their uh, different opportunities, their different insurances. They've really mm -hmm. evolved and tried to create other options. So there's one called an asset-based insurance policy yep. or another term uh, – um, hybrid. So it's asset based or hybrid. Those terms can be interchanged. And what this is, this is a life insurance policy that has a long term care component for it. And the real benefits for this type of a policy is that if it, it has a cash value component. So if you say down the road, I don't want the policy anymore, or life has changed, I can surrender it and get some money back. So that's good. There's a cash value component. So you don't you don't lose every Everything. dime you've put in. You're that's gonna correct. Have something that comes. It's back certainly to you. not an investment. You shouldn't. It's absolutely not an investment. But there's a way to get some yeah. of your money back. There's just a, there's a there's a cost of insurance, but it's not. 
Yes. It's not use it or lose it. The second component of it is it is life insurance. So you purchase this policy, you never need it, and then you pass on, you pass away. There's a death benefit that will pay out to your beneficiaries. Tom might be uh, liking that one. Right. And uh, the third component is there is the long-term care piece. So if there is a long-term care need, there's a benefit that pays out. Right. So that's this asset-based or hybrid insurance. There are annuities that have long-term care benefits. And essentially, uh, those annu- there's several different types, but the bottom line is if you have a long-term care need, the annuity will pay out additional benefits. It for increases you. your income in some way. Yes. Is it sometimes a lump sum or is it? Is it's it just generally much in just the, the payment. Got it's it. in your monthly payments. Okay. Your monthly generally. payments go up. Yes, that's correct. Another one is a life insurance policy that has a long-term care rider. What's different about this from that asset based is that it's truly a life insurance policy, but what you're able to do with this rider is with this extra feature is you're able to actually draw from your death benefit while you're still alive. So if you have a $500,000 death benefit and you just wait, you know, that will pay a hunt 500,000 out after you pass on. What you're able to do with this is you can start drawing a portion of that death benefit out every month if you have a long-term care need. So if you incur $100,000 in long-term care expenses, you could potentially draw that out, leaving $400,000 of death benefit upon your passing. So they track that for you and then... Yes, that's right. Got it. So what's really helpful with some of these products and, and... it provides a great deal of flexibility. So the original it was the use it or lose it, that tr- original traditional type. But some of these others allows you to get multiple potential uses and protections for the same premiums. Yeah, and a lot of people have a need for life insurance and a need for long-term care. Yes. Or they have a need for retirement income, but they also have a long-term care. And this has created those the just the ability to, you know, you can pay one premium right. and that one premium can take care of multiple needs. And the truth is people have limited resources. We deal with this all the time. There's this very, very seldom can everybody get a hundred percent of every single thing they want when they're looking at their financial plan. That's right. You've got to make compromises and choices and, um, you don't want to overspend mm-hmm. and overcommit resources to things like insurance. If you don't have to, we absolutely, you know, it, it's a very real thing. People don't, We don't want our clients paying more than they should. And people don't want to pay more than they should, for sure. So what what having a menu of options does, does it complicate things? Yes, unfortunately. Yeah, you're going to have some decisions to make and to get some education and go through a learning curve. And that's the downside of this situation. The good news is, is that you might be much more efficient with mitigating these risks. Yes, yes. And, it, and, and if you can be more efficient, then it becomes less of a drag, less of an issue. And let's face it, there's people out there that say, I don't like insurance because if you never need it, you've lost everything. You've, it's an, and it's not cheap insurance, especially when you're 65 trying to get this insurance. You need to start earlier if you can and have this conversation sooner rather than later. But yeah. you know, people, people have that thing about insurance. And if, by having all these other options... You can mitigate that. You said something right there. You said it's not cheap. The, the traditional, yeah. But if you if you're old and already sick, it could be unaffordable. Absolutely. But insurance being expensive or cheap, what you need to, what I try to be very mindful of is that this insurance is providing a benefit, and if you do actually have that need where the insurance pays out that insurance could actually be invaluable to you and your family yes and so what may be viewed as quote very expensive insurance today may in five years in fact be very very cheap because you're so thankful for it does that make sense yeah absolutely what i was trying to get at is like there's people that have that mental block about insurance broad brush 
I don't like insurance. Oh, yes, absolutely. And I see. they have it in their mind that it's never going to happen to me and it's the use it or lose it thing. And where I was trying to get is like with having a menu of options where you don't always use it or lose it. Yes. You can get that money back into your family. You, you can, you're not losing every dime out the door if it doesn't happen to you, Tom. Yeah, I see your point. And so that's, that's huge. But that being said, all of this... You know, it's insurance. And so when it comes to insurance related to uh, like life insurance or long-term care or health insurance, the older we get, the more expensive it gets. Yeah. So it makes tons of sense to deal with these issues much sooner than you think you should. Most people don't even think about it until mom and dad are 65 at the youngest and the truth is people really need to be starting to have these conversations with them, at least with the, with their spouse and each other as early as 50, just because the cost is so much more affordable if, yes. they, if they decide to go through it with a plan of some kind. And yes, at 50, you've got other things going on. You might have kids in college, you're planning your retirement and guess what? That's kind of life. But the truth is the truth. If you have these conversations earlier you're going to have much more flexibility in what your solution set may be. Absolutely. You're a young couple, even in your 30s, and you have a need for life insurance, for example, to take care of your, your young kids. Right. You slap on a, a life insurance, a, a long-term care rider. You may have just, in one fell swoop, addressed a large portion of that long-term care need in the distant future, and you're able to do it at a young age because you're living within your means, you've got plenty of savings, and you can budget that life insurance premium. So start early. Start and, early. And, and this goes this goes to, this is why you need to have a comprehensive plan. You can't just be focused on, fixated on your investing account or your IRA or your 401k account and just fixate on college and retirement. There's a whole other set of, the, of, of risks out there that will have a, potentially have a major, major impact on your family and we've talked about this before. We, you know, the disability is one when you're working. Life insurance is one. You, you got to have these risks, at least have them discussed, handled, mitigated. Because if they happen, it could be a huge deal. This is no different. You got to look at your whole picture. You can't just say, how did my stocks do? It's not likely to be enough. There's also some tax benefits sometimes with some of these yes. solutions. Yeah. And the IRS, uh, that it's, you know, we try to keep this content on this podcast timeless, but it's worth looking into when you're looking at your plan, whenever you're listening to this, check into whether there's some tax benefits on various solutions you may have. Because some things might be deductible, some of the benefits might be tax free, um, depending on who pays for the coverage. Uh, if it's a corporate benefit, like an employee if a, benefit. Yep. If you have a C corporation, there are some currently in tw the year 2020, as we're making this, there are some really good right. uh, tax benefits. But we're aware you may not be listening to this in 2020 and tax laws definitely can change over time. So uh, main thing is start early, have that conversation. Yep. Uh, as long as you're having that conversation, there's other considerations not just the long-term care itself or the insurances, but we were discussing all the decision-making that has to happen if somebody needs care. Yes. What do your parents want? What What do you want to happen? What Where's the road that you want to travel down, so to speak? And you need to... How do you want this to go? And to put that, to formalize that, you're going to need to talk to somebody. Yeah. Get yourself an attorney. You need to talk to an attorney. And And what are some of the elder care types of things that an attorney might create for some for a family okay well we've talked about it before i know kevin camden in our past episodes he's touched on some of this stuff but your durable powers of attorney for example uh, allow you to pick who can make decisions on your behalf from a medical perspective or a financial perspective who's making that decision so if you have multiple you have multiple siblings or multiple kids and you know you want one of your children to make those decisions you can name that person 
And that also eliminates some decision-making fatigue that the kids don't have to worry about it. They know that, okay, mom and dad said, I've got the power to make this call. So everybody should honor that. Uh, the other is, you, you know, you have living wills. It's the pull the plug document. You've, document. You've, my wishes are if this, then that. Yeah. And now I've taken that burden of decision off of your, out of your, I've taken that burden off your shoulders. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. But talking about some trusts and what can some of these elder law attorneys do, uh, there are attorneys that f specialize and focus in Medicaid planning. So if you start early and you want to make use of the Medicaid system, there are trusts and there are things you can do with an attorney who is properly trained to help you try to segregate and protect some of those assets that you have. And that, that come, you, know, you bring up a good point because a lot of folks will say, oh, I, mom and dad have to be destitute. They have to be draw down all their assets. Well, mom and dad can just gift them to the kids now, job done. And yeah. that's not the case, is it? No, no. There's, well, there's this look back period so that uh, if, if mom and dad know that they're going into a, a Medicaid facility tomorrow and they give all, everything away today, well, that's no good because there is a look back period so that met, they'll... The government will look back and grab that money right back. And, and say, so oh, you moved good. this four years, 364 days ago. Correct. And then Guess if what? you do it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so uh, we talk about being simple and effective. If you're very simplistic in your thinking and you just mom and dad say, okay, well, they'll, they'll just give everything away right now. You know, they're in their 50s and they're going to give everything away. Yeah. Well, now you just gave away all of their money that they need to live on. And so now right. they're poor. They're truly in the poor house and they have no money to live their lives. Mm -hmm. So you can't just give everything away years and years before. And you shouldn't even do it when you're 80. I mean, you, 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 you can't do that. You've got to, you've got to have a comprehensive plan that covers all the needs. Cause you can't just fixate on just, just like you can't fixate just on your 401k and your retirement. Yeah. You can't just fixate on long-term care. There's a balancing act here. You've got yes. to cover all bases and all probabilities. And this is why comprehensive planning is so important. You can't just go in and, and, and just do a one-stop shop. This is a comprehensive thing that affects yes. one thing affects another. Y your your long-term care solution might affect your retirement. Your retirement might lifestyle might offset, you know, create a problem for your long-term care covering. Yeah. If you give to your children and they spend it. And then you go into care three years from now, and then the government goes to that kid and says, we need that $50,000 that mom and dad gave you four year, three years ago. And you just spend it on your kid's college tuition. Well, now you're in your 50s, owing the government $50,000, and there's a ripple effect that goes across those generations if you have that problem. So if you're trying to think that you're going to do some sort of Medicaid planning Again, I mean, you got to use a professional. You, you better we're be We're not that careful. professional. So. That, it's not a financial planner. That's a that's an attorney. Yes. And be very very um, eyes wide open mm -hmm. if that if you think that's going to be the strategy that's right for your family. So if you do need an attorney or you want to look one up, there's a website called www. N as in Nancy, A as in Apple, E as in Edward, L as in Larry, A as in Apple. org www.naela.org. That's the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, and they have a zip code search. So where, based on where you live, type in your zip code. They'll give you a list of attorneys that specialize in this elder law that we're talking about. You know, this is definitely a sensitive issue, and, and this book creates a resource for people this book, The Conversation yep. by Harley Gordon, provides some resources, provides some information to make that a little bit easier to even broach the subject and then even process through the whole planning stage. It's unlikely that people are going to be able to do this entire process alone without professional help. There's just too many variables. There's, there's a, in, most, in a lot of cases anyway, there's just a lot of variables to consider and they do interact with one another. So it, 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 just be aware. This isn't a do-it-yourself trip to the store. Right, right. As you said, Harley Gordon 
he does have a new approach, a groundbreaking way of conducting this conversation. And so it's, it's worthwhile to, to look for this book and, and pick up a copy if you're in a situation or you know someone who's in a situation where the conversation would be beneficial. And the main thing is like, again, this isn't about selling insurance. This is about solving problems for families. Yes. It's the, the family dynamic, the family relationships in most cases are more important than the money. If, if the money is the most important thing in your family situation, I'm really sorry. I, I, I feel bad for you. But in most, I think in most people's situation, it's more about the relationships. Yes. It's more about making sure that everybody gets along. Everybody's uh, not stressed. They're not Everybody arguing. has a general understanding of what the goal is. It's just so important. It's priceless. Relationships are priceless, especially the family relationships. Uh, that's my opinion, anyway. Yes. And uh, you know that that's the main thing. That's the main reason you need to talk about this with your with your loved ones. And we say this over and over and over again. If you're on top of your overall finances in the first place everything becomes much, much easier. Living within your means, living beneath your means, being a saver, being It's a frugal. superpower. It's a superpower. Frugality is a superpower, and that doesn't mean you're living on beans and rice making $500,000 a year. That is not... Everybody, people go to the extremes too often. It just means live within your means. I mean, live on 80% of what you make, save the other 20%, you're going to have a lot more flexibility than somebody who spends 95% of what they make. Yeah. It's just the truth. It's just math. You may have extra money set aside that you can actually address some of these other issues. Very, yeah. very important. So anything else? Uh, no, I'm very grateful that folks are listening. And if they find this helpful, I'd be grateful. We'd be grateful if they would share it, pass it along to others who they think might benefit. All right, then. Well, everybody, thank you so very much again for listening to the Fierce Fiduciary Podcast. Um, we do appreciate your feedback. We, we appreciate comments that you give us on social media. You can reach us at Fierce Fiduciary on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You can reach uh, Dan and, and myself on social media as well. I'm Brian C. Beasley. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. I'm on everything. And Dan, you're on Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, so if you have questions, comments, cheap shots, please you know reach out and let us know what you think about the podcast. If you'd like to support the podcast in any way, the best thing you could possibly do is subscribe to the podcast, share the podcast. You can click like and all that kind of stuff, but shares are golden. If you can tell your friends about this podcast, we sincerely appreciate that. And hopefully we can add some value to another person that you care about. Um, and obviously we do this for a living too. So if you uh, have a need, we do have a company, Athena Private Wealth, and we're a registered investment advisor in Illinois. We own with our partner, Tom Stesich, who will be on this podcast at some point too. But again, just thank you so very much for listening. And until next time. Cue the tiger. Mm -hmm.